Amen. Good to us, amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Well, we've had a we've had a good encounter already this morning. Yeah. Now we're getting ready for the Word of God, and we're going to talk a little bit about where we've been the last couple of weeks, just as a reminder. And last week I didn't make a big emphasis of it, but we've been building towards this. We've talked about, uh, last week we talked about extravagant giving, right? And we talked about how that's, the, that's really the aim of all of our life, is to be extravagant givers. But the baseline is tithes, and, and, and then after the tithe comes the offering, and then we get the extravagant giver, and we talked about that as the ladder of generosity, right? So the, the, the ladder of generosity moves us from tithes to offerings to extravagant giving, and we've talked about that. And so, uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at kingdom principles that include the tithe. We're going to ask our, our, our own selves, each of us are going to examine our heart and, and, and say that we're going to make a commitment that we haven't made before. And no matter what level we're at, maybe we haven't even begun the tithe. We're going to maybe take that uh, challenge because we're going to issue a 90-day challenge to tithe. Maybe we've tithed, but we've never considered giving an offering above the tithe, and we're going we're gonna to look at that. And if we've given tithes and offerings, maybe today we're going to be challenged to be extravagant givers for 90 days. So that's where we're headed today. And, and what I want us to do is to acknowledge some things. The first thing that I want us to look at is that tithing is a timeless principle. Right? It's, it's the timeless principle. Some people think that it's just an Old Testament principle or that when Jesus came it, it had been kind of done away with. And you're going to see that the principle of the tithe runs throughout the entire Bible and it actually even predates the law. Some people think that it's just law bound, but it predates the law by actually a, probably a couple thousand years before Moses. It, it, it happens as early as Genesis chapter 2. I want you to turn there with me. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Because here we see in the very beginning of creation. Listen, this is before the law was given by far. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. This is actually, in my Bible, called the life in God's garden. This is how God set things up before the fall. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Sounds like work, doesn't it? Go to work, got to take care of you. It's called stewardship. We're called to steward what God has blessed us with. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now we all know these verses, right? Anybody here confused about these? Maybe never heard them before? We know that this is God's intended plan from the beginning. Early on, listen carefully, because of this principle, early on God has said, all of it is yours except... All of it is yours except. You can eat of any tree except of the tree in the center of the garden, the tree of good and evil. You can partake of all of the rest of it, but that, that's what? Mine. He gave them everything for them to enjoy. He gave them everything for them to enjoy. We, we think of life as like this struggle, this trial, this, this, this drudgery that we just get through, and we miss the joy of it all. God placed the man in the, in the midst of the garden to take care of what God had created. What an awesome thing. How, how many of you think that what God has created is junk? Anybody think that? No. But we treat life like that sometimes, as if it were. God says, the first fruits are mine. The first fruit, that tree, that's mine. 
first fruits. Now, I'm going to come back to this principle of first fruits because this is not one of the Fs that I, that I wanted to spend because it didn't go with the theme of generosity. But first fruits is how you get to the tithe. Without the first fruit, I can guarantee you, you will never tithe because it doesn't work out any other way. So the first fruits, listen, this is the place. The first fruits is the place of blessing. It's the place of peace, of protection, of provision. It's in that place that we can experience the peace, the protection, and the provision of God. I can't tell you how it amazes me, so I can't even imagine how God feels. That there are people that don't honor God in this way, that then want God to, to bless their finances and, and make provision for them. And I'm going, wait a minute. You're not honoring the Lord. How is God going to honor that which doesn't honor Him? Right? But, but because we're selfish people because of the fall, what happens is we just think that, well, I want it all, and I think God should give it to me because He's a benevolent Father. But if you're not walking in the place of the blessing, you are outside of His peace, His protection, His provision. And this is a little aside from the generosity thing. Let me take you through this very quickly. You know the story of, of Israel, right? They're, they're in bondage in Egypt. Uh, just fast forward, they're let out of the bondage of Egypt. Moses brings the people into the wilderness with the promise of the promised land. But how many times in that place did they not stay where God was or did they go where God wasn't? And in that place where they didn't stay where God was and went where God wasn't, they were outside of the peace and the protection and the provision of God. They were constantly, 40 years for a one-week trip, maybe a, maybe a month some people have even said when you're talking about a million people, but certainly no more than a month is what most experts say. I've heard is less than, as low as a week. To take the trip from Egypt to, to Canaan. It took them 40 years. And not one of that generation except for Joshua and Caleb entered into the promise. Why? Because they believed God. Listen, they believed him, and they believed him by showing by their life that they believed him. Church, we can say what we want to say, but we have to live what we say. We need to remain. So in the pillar of fire and the cloud were present, and, and, and Israel was in the place of the pillar or the cloud. Peace, protection, and provision. But it originated in the garden. And, and I want you to understand this because it applies to our life. So though, although the tithe is part of the Old Testament law, it, it's before the law. It completely even transcends the law, which is why then it's still a requirement for us today as the baseline. Not even the end all, the, the baseline, because it's part of how God set things up. All of it's yours except. Are we in agreement with that? Is that okay? So... We live in, a, in, in an age where culturally we've lost our collective minds, right? We've lost our collective minds, and we have relativism running throughout all of culture. You can't tell me what's true because your truth doesn't apply to me, right? That's, I mean, that's where we live. Now, follow me on this. So if, if I say, and I've used this for, for years and years and years as an illustration, if I took out a gun and I shot any one of you dead, what should happen to me? Why? So what? Doesn't apply to me. Your truth doesn't apply to me. It's the law, but it doesn't apply to me. Because it's all relative. It's all relative. But see, if I say that it's Thou, thou shalt not kill is in the Old Testament law, and it's in the, the law of the land, but it's only because of the law. There are no eternal values in that whatsoever. There has to be something deeper, more intrinsic, more eternal, a, a principle that the law does not give us the right to disregard grace today, but grace doesn't give us the right also to disregard grace the law. So yeah, I should be put in jail for shooting any one of you. 
But 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 grace and law they they, they coexist. There's a tension between the two, isn't there? But here's what I want us to understand for a moment. Jesus doesn't put away the law. If anything, he raises the standard. He raises the standard. And we're going to look at a couple of examples. Matthew chapter 5, 17 to 20. Do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh my goodness. Unless it exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now let me talk about something again quickly here. The kingdom of God is like, how many times did Jesus say that, right? Time and time again. He's not only talking about heaven. He said, listen, we live in the day of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is near you today. It's even in your mouth. We live in the kingdom age. But we don't enter it if we will not uphold this understanding. Unless your righteousness exceeds you shall by no means enter. There are people who want the benefits of the kingdom that don't uphold the law, if you will, of the kingdom. There are principles that apply to our life that you cannot get around because they're eternal principles. They're eternal. And Jesus raises the bar. You don't have to be just as good as the Old Testament Pharisees. You have to be better. We've heard it this way, right? That you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus said what? I tell you the truth. If you look at a woman lustfully. Yeah. Yeah. We have heard it also said. That it is written. That thou shalt not kill. I use that example. But Jesus said. But I tell you the truth. If you say raka in your heart. It, 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 how many of us have even said this right? So I said a few weeks ago. For totally different reasons. That our words matter. Have you ever called somebody stupid. Or a fool in anger before? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said. You just committed murder in your heart. That's a harsh thing, but that's a reality. And those types of living cause us to miss the kingdom in our life. We cannot expect the eternal principles of God to be violated just because we can rationalize it away in a relative society. The standard is the standard regardless of how we feel. And the righteousness of grace always exceeds the righteousness of the law. Hear me, church. The righteousness of grace exceeds the righteousness of the law. So we need to do more than the law. Because we live under grace. We live under grace. And this is a hard thing for people today because what we want is to be able to just do what we want and then we want God to bless what we do because we hope we're doing it for Him. Well, how about doing what He said to do because that's what He said to do. It all belongs to you except. Listen, in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 to 20, you can flip there while I say this. Jesus is so involved in tithing that He is actually the recipient of the tithe. You know, he's actually the recipient of it. Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> 18 to 20. Then Melchizedek, oh by the way, if you don't know this priest, read in Hebrews, he's there again. And Melchizedek is what they call a type of Christ. Yeah. He's a high priest in the, in the, in the manner of Jesus. Yeah. All right? So it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. What did we just have? Bread. 
We just had bread and wine, right? Now, we use cracker and grape juice here, but you know, I mean, that's bread and wine. Right? The high priest brought out bread and wine. But he's not only the high priest, listen carefully, he's the king. He's the king. Ruling, governing authority, sir. He's the king. We love the lion and the lamb. Right? Don't forget he's also a lion. Yeah. He governs. He rules. Yeah. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, professor, I mean possessor. Jeez, that was weird. <laughs> possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him what? A tithe, a tithe or a tenth of all. Melchizedek, the type, the foreshadow, the king and the priest, Jesus, yeah. he, he, he presented a time. So some 480 years before the law, Abraham tied to Melchizedek. Melchizedek, the priest and the king, the Jesus, he received the tithe. He received it. And in the New, book, New Testament book of Galatians, Abraham is still our spiritual father. And Melchizedek is mentioned again there as a type of Christ. He's the king of righteousness, the king of peace, all that we attribute. Listen, we're about to come into this season of, what well, in my early days in church, we called it Advent, right? The season of preparation to receive Christ into the world. And we think of like all of the prophetic words of Isaiah and, and others. Right? And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he does govern. And he shall be called Prince of Peace. Okay. Just, just checking, making sure we're there. Melchizedek is called the King of Peace. Yeah. Hebrews 5 and 7, as we said, are clear about looking at Melchizedek as a type of Christ, or a representation of Christ. So, let's talk about why this is important for a moment. Let me put this down. Some people have perverted the whole idea of the tithe because they've become selfish. They've, they've tainted it just like Satan tainted the word of God. And they've misused or abused some of these things. Or, or maybe they've become unrighteous, some of the religious leaders. And so people in the church say, you know, and this is true, God doesn't need my money. No, he doesn't need the money. But, the, but, the, but the, all of it belongs to you except still remains. Because he's God. You can have all of this, but don't eat of that. It belongs to me. The tithe belongs to him. Because he's God. The principle is a principle because Jesus is the principle. Jesus is our life. And, and so we, we, we've got to understand that the tithe still remains because... God. Just period. Because God. Abraham gives the first tenth to Melchizedek, the type of Christ. Abraham, our spiritual father, gave to Melchizedek our foreshadowing of Christ, a tenth. So, you might ask yourself, but is Jesus really receiving that? Don't we just bring it to, you know, I mean, Malachi 3.10, we're going to look at it. Bring it to the storehouse, right? Does it really belong to Jesus? You might, you might ask yourself that. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 7. See if I want to read a little before this. Verse 8. I'm just going to read. I was trying to see if I wanted to go around this side. I think verse 8 stands alone and can speak for itself. So the question is, does Jesus really receive our tithes? Is he really receiving them? Here's the answer in, in hey, church, this is the what? It's the Word of God. 
Is it true? Yeah. Is it all true? Yes. Is it always all true? Yes. Okay, so don't tell me that, well, that was then and this is 2018 and, you know, things are different now. No. Because where people are, the conditions the same. Hebrews 7, 8 says, here, here, in 2018, the Jeffrey Assembly of God, here, mortal men receive tithes. But there, he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Church, in, in December, we're going to talk about making Christmas meaningful. We're going to talk about Christmas being really only as crucial as it is to our understanding of, of the whole of the story of Jesus in relation to Easter. Because without the resurrection, just another homeless child born somewhere in, you know, in a back alley where there was no room. Now, it's a light play because we know the virgin birth. I don't mean to be disrespectful. But he lives. Today he lives. He lives today. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives. And because he lives, he is still receiving tithes of whom it is witnessed that he lives. So, so we want us to, to understand Jesus is still receiving the tithe today because it's the word of God and it's all true and it's always all true. And it doesn't matter what period of human history we live in because there is no beginning or end with God. Remember Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And until the end comes, this is all part of eternity. This is how we live. There's no beginning and end with God. He sees it all at the same time. He sees us at the same time in eternity that he sees Abraham. We just have to look back there. That's our only way to understand it because we don't have the eyes of eternity. But he does. And so because this is Old Testament, we somehow think it's disconnected to the now. No, in God's eyes, this is all the same. You might write your check to Jaffe Assembly of God, but in a very real sense, in a very real spiritual sense, you're giving it directly to Jesus because Jesus receives the tithe. It's right here. It's right there. It belongs to him. You can have it all, Genesis 2, except. You can have it all, except. Now, remember last week, for those of you that were here, we were talking about the tests and how God's desire is that we pass the test. Yeah. Right? His aim isn't to fail you. It's to give you another opportunity to pass the test. Do you remember that? Yeah. <clears throat> Some of you are not so convincing. <laughs> yeah. Some of you, 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 listen, I have them, sir. I've got to get them to you. There's video. We made DVDs at, at, at the request. So if, you, if you've forgotten or weren't here, you can get the message. We've got DVDs. It's also online on YouTube and all of that. Yeah. So we talked about God loving to test his children. He tests us. And, and tithing, we said, is probably our biggest test. The idea of the tithe. So we know that the word tithe means what? Ten. So let me give you an example of ten representing testing throughout all of Scripture, even apart from tithes. How many plagues were there in Egypt? Okay. How many commandments are there? I'm starting with easy ones, so no. Okay. How many commandments? Ten commandments. How many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? You may not know this, but there were ten tests. How many times did God test Jacob's faithfulness by changing his wages? Remember, he had to work for a time and... How many times do you suppose he changed his wages? Ten. Daniel chapter one, just chapter one. How many days was Daniel tested? Ten days. In Matthew chapter 25, it says there are a number of virgins tested to see if they were ready for the bridegroom. Do you remember how many virgins there were? Ten. All right. How many disciples did Jesus have? Okay, just check it. Just make it sure you do. All right. So, 10 represents testing throughout the scripture. And the tithe is a what? Tenth. A tithe is a tenth. 
it's also the only place where we are allowed to test God. We discussed that a little bit last week. Malachi 3.10, turn there. We haven't really delved into this. Malachi 3.10. I like the way the New Testament actually words this. I mean, the New International Version uh, words this a little different <coughs> than the New King James does. <coughs> In the New International, it says, bring the whole tithe. Not a portion of the tithe. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, right? So it says, bring the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Test him. It's his invitation. And, and he says, and see if I will not open for you the floodgates of heaven. Sounds a little bit like the 23rd Psalm that we read. My cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. God operates in the principle of the overflow. And the tithe is what brings overflow into our life. Listen carefully to that again. God operates in the principle of the overflow, and the tithe is what releases the overflow into our life. We want of the overflow, but we don't necessarily want of the tithe. He says, and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much what? Blessing. Goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. See if I won't pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough to contain it. Anybody want that much blessing in your life? <laughs> that you, you won't have room enough. You're going to have to actually like give it more away because you can't keep it even to yourself. That's, that's the extravagant giving we were talking about last week. That out of the abundance of what God pours into our life, we now are able to be extravagant givers because it operates out of the principle of the overflow. So, we're going to look in a few moments. I'm going to hand out to those that want them, or you can come and take them, whichever way you want to do this. So I'll just pass them and you can take one. I'm going to do it this week and I'm going to do it next week because a number of our folks are missing this week because of Thanksgiving. And we're going to offer you the first and ten challenge. And then you'll understand why it's first and ten in a few moments. First fruits and ten percent, right? First fruits and ten percent. But I'm going to give you the 10 10 80 principle. You ever heard the, the 10 10 80 principle? Do you guys know what that is at all? We're going to look at that in a few moments, all right? So, what we're going to do is we're going to give you opportunity to take the first and ten challenge. And I'm going to read you the card, but we're not going to do it yet. We're going to do this at the end of the message. It says, realizing God's promise in Malachi 3.10, which we just read, I accept God's guarantee with the following conditions. I will tie my income for the next 90 days to Jag. I will pray and trust God for his blessing in my life daily to be multiplied so that I will recognize them. I will inform my pastor in writing or verbally as God blesses me and or my family. And I will give through the check. Uh, through check envelope, or I don't even know if we do auto withdrawal. Do you guys have any, none of that? Okay. In order to ensure an accurate record of my giving over these 90 days. And all through the 90 days, what we're going to do is give opportunity to testify about the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the floodgates of heaven being poured out upon the people of God, so that it will encourage others who may not yet be there in their faith walk to take the challenge themselves. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit about the 10 10 80 principle. The 10 10 80 principle, this is something that, again, um, Larry Burkett, I think, is the first place I remember hearing some of this. I think Dave Ramsey may use some of this, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in this. But here's how the 10 10 principle, 10 10 80 principle works. When I work with people who, remember last week I talked about God being, that means people being much more willing to share with me about the personal, intimate details of their life than they are about finances. Well, I've come to the realization that people don't understand that God's not concerned only with your giving. He's concerned with your giving, with your saving, and with your spending. 
And I could do a whole other series of sermons, on, you know, to owe no man anything, you know, to not be in debt, all of these kinds of things. But finances, man, we get all messed up because we live in a culture where it's consumerism run rampant, yeah. just out of control. And we're coming up to a season again where people get carried away because we just want to give, give, give to, to, to people that we think somehow that somehow is more than enough. So the 10, 10, 80 principle is this. And, and here's why I want you to think about this. I am so convinced that God will not fail that I'm asking you to step up to this today, totally, regardless of what state financially you find yourself in. This works for everybody. And I'm convinced of that. And where is an independent church that I founded? I just got to tell them this time. I know we're not doing it, but I got to tell them anyway because I already told you this. Were this an independent church that I had founded, I would have given you a 90-day money-back guarantee. Because I am so convinced at the end of 90 days, you will see God's favor on your life if you will faithfully honor Him. That if it were not so, you could get your money back. Now, I'm not an independent church, so I can't do that. But I want you to know that I believe, honestly, you will be better off moving forward because you're blessed by God. I am completely convinced of that. So here's the 10 10 80 financial principle. The first 10% belongs to who? God. That's called your giving. Right? That's your giving. Some people use the word generosity. But you'll see on the card here, I call it giving, saving, and living. When I financially counsel people, I call it giving, saving, spending, whatever word. Right? Generosity is what some people call it. Your first 10% belongs to God. And we believe that generosity matters and giving matters. I mean, this is, this is what this is all about. It matters. It matters to God because he set this whole thing up. And it matters to us because it's the only way that it, it operates so that we can receive out of the overflow. Mm -hmm. yeah. It matters to us. And so the 10%, first 10% yeah. belongs to God. And it needs to be made a priority. That's called the first fruits. When you prioritize. Because if I were to, oh, it's in my bag over here. If I were to open my wallet right now and look at my wallet, because it's Sunday morning, and determine what am I going to give? Do you think I have a tenth of my income? Not today. Not today. Right? And so the first fruits means that I've honored God with the best that I have from the ground. So you gotta, you got to decide whether or not you're willing to give before you spend. Because if you spend, there is nothing left to give. Trust me. My own testimony. During all of Reaganomics, when it was supposed to be trickle-down economics and things were supposedly economically good, and I was having a young family and buying diapers on credit cards and paying 28% interest, you know, on formula and diapers and things, and things were just not working. And I decided in the midst of that time, I've got to tithe. I've got to do this. So then started to tithe, and it, it didn't hit me immediately. I don't know when it hit me, but I, at some point it hit me that during the, the daddy bush, when the economy seemed to go into a slight bit of a recession, that I was better off than I'd ever been in my life. Out of debt for the first time in my life as a, as a, as a young adult. You know, it just, it just works, and, and I can't tell you how, I just know that it does. Right? And so you've got to decide to give before you spend. You've got to decide what matters to you most and, and make it a, a family-wide affair. I was, I was wishing that the Somaros were here today just because I'd love to include children in this. Get them started young. Right? Get them started young. And giving is often sacrificial. So take a look at your spending habits and see what you can give up in order to be able to do this because that's part of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Right? Give it or generosity. Save it. Any financial counselor that's a biblical principle will tell you this too. Listen, you've got to have something set aside. So that when those hard times come, it doesn't send you spiraling into financial ruin. And so the next 10% needs to, to, to be something that you intend. Listen, savings don't happen by themselves. Can anybody testify? It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't just stockpile. It just doesn't. 
So you've got to set yourself up for yourself an interest uh, in, in your own future. Set up a savings account. I know the interest rates are 0.01% or whatever they are now, but just set it aside. Because it's a principle. You don't want to owe anything to anything. And if, if hardship comes, and it will come, you have this set aside. Because again, if you don't set it aside, even this has to come before spending. Because if it's not set aside, if you spend, you won't have it to put in. I, mean, I worked in banks after high school for a short period of time. And maybe they still do, I don't know. Anybody remember the old Christmas clubs? Yeah. You remember those things, yeah. right? So you take part of your paycheck and you put it into the Christmas club so that when you get to this time of year, you were not going in hot yeah. because you wanted to buy Christmas gifts for everybody that you loved. That was part of that. Set it aside first because if you spend it, it will be gone. I remember as a kid, credit cards didn't exist. Now we just got a piece of plastic and we think, I can afford it. No, you can't. The minimum revolving balance, this is a scary t statistic, I think this was in 1990 or so, maybe 91, 92, somewhere in that area. The minimum revolving balance on a credit card that was even only $1,000 would take 28 years to pay off. I wonder why people can't give or save, because we're spending first and then just existing to try to pay it back. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't work that way. So you've got to set this up however you need to do it. That's why some people put, you know, the world even knows this. So they understand the principle of the 401k. Put it aside first, before, right? So save so that you can then live. Eighty percent. That's, that's what it leaves you with, 80%. Mm -hmm. We should be able to live there. We should be able to live there. But most of us can't because our consumption is so much more than that. Because we've been sold a bill of goods. Madison Avenue has done a fantastic job of telling you what you need and you believe them. And I don't necessarily mean anyone here. I don't know your conditions in your heart. Nobody shared that with me yet. But culturally, I know it's the truth. Right? So much so that there are now get out of debt finance companies out there because people are just in way over their head and they're drowning. And culturally, we're out of control. You guys remember just a few years ago, we gave billions of dollars to the auto industry, to the insurance. I remember ING bailouts, all of that kind of stuff. And then as soon as ING was bailed out, they had like a three quarter of a million dollar leadership retreat out in California. I'm like, how does that make sense? Like, what do we do that? But we live like this because we're out of control. And so we, we think we need the new car when all we really need is a mode of transportation. Amen. We just need yeah. something to get us around. Yeah. Right? We don't need to go into hot for all this stuff. We can live on 80% of what we make if we're doing it right. But the problem is we've been sold and building goods. And so here's some of the benefit of tithing. The first thing, and we talked about this at length last week, it makes us like Jesus. I mean, really, that's... For the Christian, there ought to be no higher aim than that. Yes. That ought to be our motivating factor. It makes me to be like Jesus. Jesus receives the tithe. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, he affirms the tithe. He proves his own generous nature by offering up his entire life, not just a tenth of his life, but his entire life for you and for me. The second thing is, the first one is what? We get to be like Jesus. Jesus. And the second thing is we get to be blessed. We get to be blessed. This is the principle of God's blessing. Right? We just read about God opening the floodgates of heaven. The windows of heaven pouring out so much blessing <clears throat> that we wouldn't be able to contain it. I want to read to you one more verse of scripture here. It's a longer verse, but 2 Chronicles chapter 31. 2 Chronicles 31. Verses 4 through 10. 
Second Chronicles 31, <clears throat> 4 through 10. Moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and the Levites that they may devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the children of Israel and Judah who dwelt in the cities of Judah brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things which were consecrated to the Lord their God, they laid in heaps. And in the third month they began laying them in heaps, and they finished in the seventh month. No response. Look at it. In the third month they began, and they finished in the seventh month. Four months of laying things in heat before the Lord. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Like, like this is a long, ongoing activity, and that sets the baseline for us. In the third month, they began laying them in heaps, and they finished in the seventh month. And when Hezekiah and the leaders came and saw the heaps, they did what? They blessed the Lord. They blessed the Lord and his people, Israel. So, so in Acts chapter 2, when it says that they enjoyed the favor of all the people, this is happening in the Old Testament. They're enjoying all the favor of Hezekiah. Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offering into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have plenty left, for the Lord has blessed his people, and what is left is this great abundance, the overflow, church, the overflow. He operates out of the principle of the overflow. We have in abundance these leftover heaps. Is anyone listening to me? Like, are you getting this? Hezekiah took over in a period when there was extreme depravity and unrighteousness. Extreme. And they were both physically and spiritually starving in his day. And he said, we'll get ourselves out of this mess. God's people began to tithe but the 90% got bigger and bigger. The heaps were the overflow. Are, are you hearing me? Extreme poverty, extreme depravity, extreme unrighteousness, spiritually and physically starving people, and they began to tithe, and the 90% got bigger. In a time of extreme poverty, hunger, depravity, unrighteousness, they honored the Lord in the time, and then 90% got bigger. Glory to God. Praise Jesus. It doesn't make sense. Praise it doesn't make sense, sir. <laughs> Not in the natural. <laughs> but, but this is, and so what we try to do is we, we try to make sense of it in the natural, and when it doesn't make sense, we go, well, I can't do it. Yeah. But obedience begets blessing. Right. Obedience begets blessing. Their tithes then became bigger and bigger because 90% was bigger and bigger. So their tithe became to the point where they were mounting up heaps for four months. Like you, uh, uh, Listen, <laughs> Jeffrey Assembly of God, my vision is expansive, both for Jeffrey Assembly of God and for the IPHC and New England and all this. And man, I want this. I want heaps mounted up so we can just do the work of the king with no limitation. And you're blessed too, by the way, because your 90% is bigger too. So you receive benefit from it. It's not just the benefit to the storehouse, it's the benefit to the people. There's this upward cycle in this principle of the overflow. And Hezekiah said, explain it to me. Is, is everyone doing okay? Like, like looking at it, if I ask people to give 10%, 
Are they going to be okay? People that are already hurting financially, already hurting spiritually, already hurting in their condition in, in, in terms of righteousness and depravity and all of that. And, and the priest said, things have never been better. Never been better. Never been better. Never better. Bruce, never better. You hear me? Never better. We don't give to be blessed, but every time we give, we get blessed. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Like, like our motivation should be, I just want to be like Jesus. Yeah. I just want to be obedient. But when I do, oh, God's blessing is so amazing. I get to be like Jesus. I get to be blessed. And then I get to be a part of God's plan. Don't you want to be part of God's plan? Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't you want to be a part of his unfolding plan of redemption? We're still living in the age. We still have time to impact the world with the gospel. Yeah. We get to make a difference in people's lives for the sake of the gospel. Yeah. The call of the gospel. What could the body of Christ do today? Just think about this for a moment. If everybody who believed time. Mm -hmm. What could the body of Christ do? Wow. Do you think we could do it more effectively than the government? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not taking 33%. I'm asking for 10, right? I mean, that's, just think about this. And, and we could do it more effectively. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the church, if we could do this. And, and, and so I'm not even asking you to look at Acts where it says that they sold houses and gave everything. We're just talking about the baseline. Right, to make that commitment to uphold the, the base. Needy families wouldn't have to be turned away. Mm -hmm. Widows and orphans. You know, I had a friend of mine, he was a former Catholic priest that performed his wedding when he left the priesthood. And in his days as a priest, though, he used to go over to Calcutta and he was a, he was a father to, to Mother Teresa. You know, he'd hear her confession, like Mother Teresa probably needed to confess anything. But anyway. That's another matter, right? And so Brian became an elder in one of my churches, and Brian tells a story. He tells the story of one of the times one of the sisters came in and knocked on Mother Superior, Mother Teresa's door. And Brian was in the office when this happened. And the compound that they had in Calcutta. Now, you, you maybe remember some of the stories of this, right? They would find orphans and, 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 and homeless people eating off of the garbage heap, the maggot filled, fly infested dung heaps of India. Mm -hmm. They'd bring them into the orphans, no, I mean, into the orphanage, no questions asked, and they just trusted God to make provision. And nobody was turned away. But there was a day, the knock came on the door. And one of the sisters came in and she said to Mother Teresa, she said, Mother Teresa, the, the, the $10,000 mortgage is, is due today and we don't have it. Mother Teresa just said, God's going to provide. God's going to provide. But Mother Teresa, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's due today. I've got to go to the bank and we've got to make the deposit or they could foreclose on the orphanage. God will provide. Nobody turned away. God will provide. Well, a little time went on, Brian said, that, you know, the sister left and kind of, like, just like I was trying to figure out, I don't understand how this is going to work. doesn't make sense to me. Well, don't you know, Brian said, another knock came to the door. They invited the person in, and the person said, God told me, this in church, in a one-off, not the most, in one of the most poverty-stricken areas on the face of the earth, God told me, person showed up, said, God told me, poverty-stricken area to give you a check for $10,000. Amen. And, and Brian was there. It doesn't make sense in the natural. How in one of the most poverty-stricken areas of the world can God get a hold of a person in that location to send them to that location to give them the exact amount that they need, which is more than most people in India could probably afford to. Listen, last I have a friend, Pastor Thompson, that lives over in India to these days still. And just a couple of years ago, he was over here in the States and he was staying with Deb and I. And, and the average pastor in India today, they get to eat meat once a month if they're lucky. They get $20 a month if they get paid that month. You know, this is the, the, the place that these people live in, right? 
And, and so what we've got to see is, how can God do this? Because in the natural, it doesn't make sense. Right. But he does it. Yes. He does. We get to be a part of that. Amen. We get to be a part of God's plan on this earth that every soul would be saved, that the needy would be clothed and fed, and you know, all of that. You all have seen like Operation Blessing and you know, those types of things and the, the back to school backpack programs that are out there and everything. We get to be this. How about if, if wouldn't, wouldn't we as the body of Christ like to see marriages saved? Wouldn't that be a great testimony? Yeah. Like if we have laborers enough to be, how about, how about like we'd like to see the addicted really delivered? Wouldn't that be a great thing? Like team challenge and places like that that operate Christian principles that, that see effective results. Wouldn't that be great if they had no monetary concerns because the body of Christ was just faithful? You know, all of these types of things. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is. For where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. So is your treasure stored up in heaven where Jesus receives the tithe? Is it in our own wallet where we seek to feed ourselves. 10%, you can have it all, except. That's what God said, you can have it all, except. And, and, and the challenge for us is to realize that we can be like Jesus. 